Good afternoon, church family. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the 84th Psalm. We're going to exposit the entirety of this psalm. One of my favorites, I would confess to you. And, you know, so often going through the Bible with the church family back in the state of Maine where, where I pastor, so often I, I try for five to ten minutes leading up to the text to set the scene. There's a setting, there's a historical context, and uh, oftentimes trying to bring a word picture as to who the audience was, who the author was. And as we come to this 84th Psalm, I believe you and I, uh, we don't need to spend too much time doing that because we have for this weekend, beginning with Thursday, Friday, and certainly today, we have had this experience and uh, it would be right to call it a pilgrimage that many have traveled, not just from around the community, some have traveled several hours, some have come from outside the borders of Kenya, some have come from different countries like myself and many others, and there has been a pilgrimage. We have journeyed together to be at this conference. And as we come to this 84th Psalm, you will understand that we have experienced much as what the author puts down on paper. And I think as we look at this, there will be a heightened appreciation for this 84th Psalm. Begin there in the title. It begins by saying, to the chief musician, on an instrument of Gath, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Verse 1, how lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. It says in verse 3, even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you, Selah. Verse 5, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on a pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O oh Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory and no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And the psalm ends here in verse 12. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Would you guys pray with me before we dissect the text? Father, thank you for the goodness demonstrated to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we are participants, being the body of Christ, even those who just moments ago threw their hand up in the air, professing their need for forgiveness, Lord, thank you for the adoption that we have into a heavenly and eternal family. I pray, Lord, as we, for these next minutes together, as we open the Holy Scripture, Lord, would you, by the Holy Spirit, minister to us, speak to us, and help us, Lord, to apply the truths contained within this 84th Psalm. Apply it to our lives. We need your help. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For centuries, there are theologians and scholars who have referred to this 84th Psalm as the pilgrimage prayer. It's the pilgrimage prayer. Worshippers of God who long to draw near and nearer to God, and certainly there's a way of communing with him in a deeper way. And there's incredible adjectives, there's a description given to us here, and there's emotion, uh, there's intention, there is a state of worship and a posture, but Ultimately, we are aware, New Testament Christian, as the Apostle Paul tells us at least two times, 1 Corinthians 10 and again in Romans 15, Paul the Apostle tells us that everything that was written aforehand, everything of the Old Testament, it is for our learning and for our admonition. And so we come to this 84th Psalm, and certainly there are some different arrangements that the Old Testament Jewish believer would have versus what you and I Gentiles, predominantly Christian church might have. But there's a principle here. Our author articulates in this 84th Psalm a nearly inexpressible cry. 
There's something that is hard to even articulate as the uh, sons of Korah who write this psalm, they begin to describe something that I believe every one of us we are familiar with. As he or she approaches the presence of God, as we draw near and near on our pilgrimage, that there is something inexpressible. In the Old Testament, of course, there were at least three uh, feasts throughout the calendar year where the children of Israel, in particular the men who are over the age of their bar mitzvah, were to make a journey. And of course, during the days of the Babylonian exile and, and uh, even through the days of the, the Roman dispersion, that the Jews would often travel thousands of miles. And you can imagine as they came into the nation state of Israel, maybe from the north coming through Galilee and down through Samaria, and eventually as they're going to enter into what would be Jerusalem, you can imagine the anticipation. And again, I know many here, we've experienced just a, a, a taste of an anticipation leading up to such a conference. We've experienced the worship together. We've experienced the music. We've experienced so much Bible teaching. And certainly if you're here in the room and you are a Christian and you have a level of discernment, we are all aware that God has manifested his presence through the praise of his people. There's been something special that we have partaken in. And, and likewise, the author is drawing nearer and nearer to such an arrangement. But again, you and I, Christian, we are on a greater pilgrimage. It is scattered throughout the New Testament, but one example is Peter writing to the dispersed Christian church in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter writes and begins his epistle saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims and to the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Peter writes to the pilgrims. He writes to Christians, those who the Bible says we have not made our homeland here on earth, but we are passing through. Are you guys grateful, fellow Kenyans, fellow Americans, fellow Europeans, Christians who are in the gathering today? Are you grateful as I am that this earth is not our permanent home? We are passing through. And there should be, I believe, a posture and an attitude. There should be a perspective that God would desire for you and I on this pilgrimage. And as far as I can see it, there are three categories of people represented, including here. I believe that there may be a fugitive in the midst. A fugitive is someone who is running from home. Maybe you're familiar with the term a vagabond. That would be the second category. A vagabond is someone who is without a home. Aimless, no direction. Maybe you remember when that was once you. You didn't know what your purpose was, what God's plan. In fact, you didn't recognize God in any of the thought life throughout your day. And truly, you were a vagabond, aimlessly walking to and fro. But it's not just a fugitive, and certainly this isn't a vagabond's prayer. We're talking about those who are a pilgrim. Someone who knows that they are journeying home. And Christian, this is written to you and I. This is written for you and I. This is a psalm for those of us who are heading home. You know, it was Pastor Zach in the last session uh, reminding us of that famous book written by Jonathan Bunyan, A Pilgrim's Progress. It is worth noting that no one probably would care or read a book entitled A Vagabond's Progress, A Fugitive's Progress. No, it's a pilgrim's progress because there is something so special when we realize that God, the creator, has made us for eternal existence and fellowship with him. And so you notice in verse one how this begins. Just notice the language. And if I haven't yet said it, let me break the psalm down into three sections. In verses one through four, we'll take note that the joy of the believer is made known. The joy of the pilgrim. Christians, you agree the Fruit of the Holy Spirit, including in that list that Paul gives us, is joy. But also in verses 5 through 8, it'll describe the journey of the believer. And lastly, as the psalm concludes, verses 9 through 12, it'll describe the jealousy of the believer. Now I say that because ultimately we'll read here, there is no jealousy and there's no envy of a true pilgrim. That we could be in the presence of God and we would envy no man, no woman. And we'll look at that as this continues. Verse 1, it tells us, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I mean, again, descriptive language from a man. The sons of Korah given to us here as the authors. Now, we'll get into them in just a moment, but how lovely 
My soul longs, it even faints, it cries out. There is a yearning and a longing described to us, as I made mention in the beginning, this is something inexpressible, trying to articulate what is happening. But you think about your story, and certainly I think of my story and my past, living in rebellion, living as a vagabond or a fugitive, a prodigal. And I consider and I certainly remember when my heart and my flesh cried out for other things. Do you remember, brother or sister, visitor here today, do you know, have you experienced when the desires of the earthly things and the, the carnal things and trying to itch every scratch and trying to listen to every impulse and do you remember the days when your flesh cried out for other things? The Rolling Stones, I don't know if you're familiar with the band. It was the Rolling Stones who famously put down into lyrics, they says, I can't get no satisfaction. They said, I try and I try and I try, but I can't get no. No, 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 they said. There is no satisfaction when we look to the things of this world. And I believe likewise you consider apart from Christ, where can we actually satisfy that deep hunger within us? And well, this is what the psalmist is describing. He describes and he articulates for us this journeying towards the presence of God, that there is something yearning deep within. In fact, there is a deeper appetite of humans. It goes far beyond our flesh. And there's a deeper appetite within all of us. It goes beyond our emotions. And the appetite is something that is soulish. It is spiritual. That, As Pastor Ken has been taking us through the books of beginnings, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we, unlike every other created thing on planet Earth, were made to have fellowship with our Creator. That is listed for us here. No chemical, no romance, no hobby, no forms of pleasure could satisfy this longing. Do you remember those days in your life where you searched? I would add to that, no religious system, no program could satisfy the appetite in fact, described to us in verse 2, it's not just the courts of the Lord, but also notice it is the living God that is being yearned for. Christian, are you grateful that we don't serve some God of the history, some God behind us? We don't read about a God who went into the grave to pay for our penalty and our crimes of sin and then stayed there that three days later he rose again and that he would manifest himself to over 500 people at one time and walk with all the disciples for 40 days, speaking and telling and teaching of the kingdom of heaven and then pouring out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And now the Spirit of God dwells with us and in us, never leaving us nor forsaking us. It is the presence of God, not just the house of God. In fact, there's a wonderful reminder as a minister there's a wonderful reminder to all of us who are shepherds, pastors, elders. I am reminded how important it is that more than just offering some self-improvement plan or a place where social connections are made, I want to be sure that the place in which God has counted me faithful as a manager, that that place is nothing more than a meeting place between the pilgrim and the presence of God. And this is what is described. You know, fascinating as we look here, the author's given to us in the inscription, into the title, it is the sons of Korah. Throughout the Old Testament, these uh, families are brought known to us, in particular, 1 Chronicles chapter 9. It was the sons of Korah who we find are vocational ministers. In other words, these are men who worked and made a living and were called by God because of their family lineage. They were vocational ministers. They were like the deacons or the, the gatekeepers of the tabernacle, and that would continue when Solomon would build the temple. So in other words, the, the author who put Psalm 84 down on paper for us all these thousands of years later to study, these are men who have had a privilege of having a front row, up close, personal view of God's spirit at work amongst his people and amidst his sanctuary. And any vocational minister, anyone who spends time working and serving in the kingdom of God, you are watching God's spirit at work in the lives of God's people. And certainly this is the backdrop of which Psalm 84 is written. This is a man who understands how God works, has experienced God's work, and is certainly longing that it would continue. And that has been our prayer, Christian, this weekend. 
that we are asking that God, as you have been so faithful to meet us here, would you continue? Moments before the worship team led us, we prayed and said, God, would there be long lasting fruit? Lord, that those who have put their hands up this weekend, those who have come forward as Pastor Ken on Thursday night gave an invitation, even those Christians who are weary and are discouraged, and maybe you've been serving the Lord for a long time, that there would be an, uh, an increase in our longing, in our desire to see God continue to further his work. That is what the sons of Korah are writing. I certainly, as a pastor, I have a privilege. Think about this in this room right here. Think about where anywhere else on planet Earth would all of us gather in one room for such a prolonged period of time and find such unity? Where could we find such a thing? Where could so many people from so many different nations with people with different backgrounds and experiences, people with different hurts and emotions, think about where anywhere else we could all gather together, we could endure at times the heat, we could endure at times sitting for prolonged periods of time, long lines, and yet we would do it with a sense of gratitude and drawing near and near to the presence of God. As it continues in verse 3, describing the joy of the believer and the perspective of the psalmist, he says, even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself. There's a saying back in the United States, it's a bit of an adage, I don't know if it translates here, but the saying is this, the lone sparrow. It is because the bird, the sparrow, it has been known to be quite solitary. Unlike many other birds who at times they will team up and mate for life. And the sparrow, it's a lone sparrow. And that usually describes when used in an adage or an idiom, it's describing a man or a woman who tends to be solitary. And again, in the context is the, the, the vocational minister, the sons of Korah, acknowledging God's spirit at work in the tabernacle, acknowledging even the lonely man or woman has a place. Even the person who has been cast out of every circle of life that this secular, fallen, sin-cursed world has to offer, they find a place here. Can I testify to you, as a former man enslaved to heroin, a man who, in wanting to be liked, only found myself excommunicated from every social circle I was in. The irony of it. Sin had brought me to a place, and certainly the devil would love to do that to all of us had brought me to the place where I seemed to be an outcast in many a circle and was so grateful for the house of God and the people of God and the manifestation of the presence of God that would welcome even the most solitary person. That's acknowledged here. And maybe the psalmist is making simply an observation in verse 3. Maybe the observation when referencing the the sparrow and the swallow who has found a nest for herself in the place of God, maybe just making an observation as he considers the natural world around him. Pastor Ken alluded to that. But would you agree, as you look around the animal kingdom, there doesn't seem to be any identity crisis happening. You look around, whether it's the dog or the cat or the lion or the zebra or the giraffe or the bird, I don't know if there's much of an identity crisis that takes place with the animal. It was in Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, a certain scribe came and said to Jesus, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Well, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It would seem Christ himself knew that he too was on a pilgrimage. He's our example. Christ himself would invite us to not make this world our home, but to follow him to the Father's house. And certainly the sons of Korah here describing a pilgrimage. Christian, are you aware that we are on a pilgrimage? That we are heading to the place that we will be in the presence of God, the tabernacle of God given to us in Revelation 21 and 22. There's no need for the son, for the son of God himself is the source of all light. No weeping, no sorrow, no pain. There's a place where God will start over. He will make a new heaven and a new earth and the new Jerusalem that comes down and it tells us that God will dwell with his people and his people will dwell with him. That we are on a pilgrimage through this sin-cursed world, drawing closer and closer to him. It was Augustine who wrote famously. Augustine said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until it rests in you. One Christian author, I wish I could give you his name, I wrote it in my phone long ago, but listen to this profound truth. One author said it this way, 
As human beings, we are the only species capable of not living up to our creational destiny. I'm going to say that one more time. As human beings, we are the only species capable of not living up to our creational destinies. God created us to have fellowship with him. Sin entered the picture. It is the design of God, the will of God, that all men would come to him. The Bible tells us that God is long-suffering, 2 Peter 3, verse 9, not desiring that any would perish. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, for this is the will of God, drawing all men to repentance, that all men and women would come to the knowledge of the truth. God desires, and our creational destiny is that we would dwell with him forever. Can we agree that men and women, there are many who will not dwell with him forever? That there are men and women who will perish eternally, drawing farther and farther away from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Very fascinating. Maybe the observation given to us in verse 3 is simply that. That it seems the animal kingdom doesn't have the crisis that you and I, human beings, because Satan has a target on our back, that we might not live up to our creational design. Blessed are those, in verse 4, who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Did you guys notice that word there, still? Did you notice the longevity? They will still be praising you. You know, making light of the fact that satisfaction can be found. That there is an unmistakable joy of the pilgrim. Some translations, the New American Standard Bible, verse 4 is this way. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. It's what was given to us in the last session. As Pastor Zach led us through the Sermon on the Mount and describing that there are two buildings, two foundations, and that regardless, there's always going to be storms that come, and so it is here. Circumstances do not dictate our joy. As Job said in Job chapter 1, verse 21, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And, and think about a wonderful thought. We have ahead of us, Christian, as we are looking to our eternal homeland in the presence of God, as we are journeying nearer and nearer, one second and one hour, day, week, month, and year at a time, as we are drawing closer to the presence of God, you and I have an eternal worship session. You go through the Old Testament and the prophets and you go into the New Testament, you end at the book of Revelation. Fascinating to me is you always have these glimpses like Isaiah chapter six, as he gets a view into the throne room, you know, the year that King Uzziah died. I looked and I saw the Lord high and lifted up and there were seraphim, one crying to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. Zechariah the prophet has something so similar. John the apostle gets called up in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5 and the description given that still thousands of years later, the angels are crying, holy, holy, holy. The 24 elders in the immeasurable multitudes of every nation, tongue, tribe, people gathering together, worshiping the Lord. And again, we have had this weekend something so special. I was talking to a brother just moments ago. And he was expressing to me the gratitude of this conference. He was expressing to me about the worship sessions and the Bible teachings. And, and we acknowledge together that isn't that so life on earth? We have these spiritual mountaintop experiences such as this weekend, and they are good for our soul. They are a good reminder. They're a taste of heaven. But then we go often back to the, the valley lows. We go back to life. We go back to responsibilities. We go back into the world. And certainly we are reminded, I hope, as this conference begins to conclude, that we have tasted just a tiny bit of heaven. And even in a setting like this, maybe you're not as carnal as me, but I find at times, even in the midst of such a beautiful setting with all the worship, sometimes my mind will betray the setting. I will have things that pop into my mind during a time of worship, things that I won't share with you. I'm amazed that even on this side of eternal uh, destiny, the eternal shoreline of heaven, that even in the times of worship, in the times of church service, in the times of Bible studies, sometimes some responsibility later in the week comes up, or sometimes I get angry that that person's sitting in my seat, or sometimes I get angry about the way this person is out of key. Stupid things. And sometimes you're reminded that here on the journey, we still wrestle with our sinful nature. Are you looking forward to the day when we get to the place where that will all be gone? You ever think about the effects of sin? I'm not talking about the big glaring ones like murder, rape,
kidnap government and corruption. I'm talking about the things that are a bit more finite and elementary, more foundational, insecurity, pride, lust, aches, pains, fears, sorrows, worries. Those things that we deal with incessantly because we are in an arrangement currently where we still walk around in a body that is in rebellion. There is this, the, the flesh that has fallen. Do you look forward to the worship session in heaven where all of that is gone? The psalmist here is describing this incredible journey and the joy of the believer. But picking up in verse 5, there's also a journey that is now described. In verse 5, read down with me to verse 8. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on a pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength, and each one appears before God in Zion. In verse 8, O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. In a few verses, it seems he transitions from the attitude and the joy and the emotion of the believer and the pilgrim drawing near. But then he goes in verse 5 to 8, and he describes the journey. We would all agree this journey known as life, it requires strength. In this journey that you and I are on in life, it requires endurance. A source is needed, isn't it? I remember years ago sitting in the Calvary Residential Discipleship class, Pastor Ken Gray's, the discipleship program where I began to learn to walk with the Lord. And everyone, the men and women in that discipleship program for that one year, we all loved Wednesdays. Wednesdays was a bit of a break from the, 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 the typical schedule. And we would sit in class for hours. We'd break for lunch, have an afternoon class. We'd break for dinner, and then we'd have church service. It was something like this. It was just worship and Bible teaching. And it was, everyone loved Wednesdays. And I remember during that season of Pastor Ken and some of the other elders and pastors that would exhort us and teach us, and this, um, this focus and this kind of exhortation that we would memorize Scripture that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of God by applying our minds to memorizing scripture. In Jeremiah 17, I remember Pastor Ken laying out the contrast between the man who trusts in man and the man who trusts in the Lord. And in this context of life that is difficult and the journey that we are on and that there is difficulties in this life, I don't need to convince any of you of that. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse five, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who makes man his flesh and makes his arm his strength, whose heart, it says, departs from the Lord. He shall be like a shrub in the desert. He shall not see when good comes, but he shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. Isn't that terrible? Even the strongest, most good-looking, most athletic man, even the most beautiful, articulate, lovely, and charming woman, if we have our source being ourself, we are cursed, the Bible says. But blessed is the man whose heart is noticed set on a pilgrimage. A purposed in heart, focused, GPS coordinates are saying, I'm going to heaven and I don't care what's in the way. I'm going to be with other pilgrims. I'm going to surround myself with like-minded people. I'm going to be in the presence of God as much as I can on this side of eternity until I get to the real demonstration. A heart set on a pilgrimage. Again, we're not fugitives. We're not running from home. We're not vagabonds here. We're not without a home. We are pilgrims, and you and I are heading towards an eternal home. Again, in verse 6, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. I'll point out to you that word there, Baca. The root word, according to my interlinear, according to the study in the concordance that you many of us have access to, and you understand the, the native tongue and language in which this Old Testament was written in, Baca has this Hebrew root from the word weeping or sorrow. In other words, the valley of crying, the valley of pain, the valley of weeping and sorrow. This is the place which I bet many of us are so familiar with. On this side of eternity, this journey, we so often find ourselves in a place of pain, in a place of loss place of difficulty. And yet you notice that even that man, as they go through it, they find a way to make it a spring. Why? It's not some self-help method. It's because they have a source to draw from. The living waters. 
There's a source that even in the desert and even in the place of difficulty, even in the places where it seems like everyone else is forsaken, that we have a source that we might draw from. One of my favorite areas of King David's life in 1 Samuel chapter 30, a man who had been on the run for nearly 15 years, a man who had finally taken matters into his own hands, a man who was running from the Philistines, running from the Israelites. He had a small group of men with him. And even in that 30th chapter, his own men began to turn on him. And it was there in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8, where it says, and finally David strengthened himself in the Lord. When everyone else had forsaken David, when everyone else had turned on David, when David realized that his own plans and his own plotting weren't all that wonderful, he says, you know what? There's one who draws near and is closer than a brother. We have a source. And the, the, the psalmist describes, even through the valley of pain, you and I, Christian, we have something the world doesn't have, that we have the presence of God living with us. We have the presence of God and the promises of God. And you know what is so beautiful? We also do have the people of God, that we have the house of God that we can run to. There is a source that we can draw from. There is a strength. There's a watering hole for those of us who go through trials. And have you ever considered how this pilgrimage is one of continued loss here on earth? I mean, just think about your life and parents. Sometimes you're reminded as you are now raising little children and, and you think about this short and brief life that we deal with. 70 years, 80 years, maybe 90. Think about how it's just one continual loss after another. I mean, first we lose our baby teeth. And then we lose our youth. And then we lose some friends along the way. And then we will begin to lose our hair and our teeth and our hearing. And then we'll begin to lose our loved ones. I mean, you think about how life is just full of loss and loss and loss. And yet, we have to consider that there's a source. What is the source, Christian, that we have? A visitor here today, do you have that source? Do you have this person, Jesus Christ? It is the pastoral epistle writing to Titus, the Apostle Paul in Titus chapter 2, verse 4. He says this, I exhort older women that they would admonish the young women, that they would love their husbands to love their children. Now maybe that seems like a random verse to cite in the moment I just did, but just consider this. The word there used several times, love, as Paul writes to these spiritual leaders and writes to the Christians, the word is not the typical word we think of agape, we think about that unconditional, godly, divine, fatherly love, but that's not the word used. When Paul the Apostle, exhorting young pastor Titus and describing to him the example that a wife should love her husband and should love her children, the word is phileo. In other words, it's to be friends with, to enjoy, because it goes by so quickly. Can you agree, Christian, that God has created you and I, that we would actually experience joy and happiness now? To the married folk, I know there's been a lot of exhortation as we've been going through the book of Genesis to the men and women, husbands and wives, but can we be reminded again that this brief journey that you and I are on, that God has been so kind to maybe give us a spouse and children, I certainly can take heed and say, God, I want to enjoy and have friendship and companionship. I want to enjoy on this journey, even through difficulty. I want to love and be friends and have companionship with the people you've put in my life. And I believe having the eternal perspective as a pilgrim, it helps us to have a grateful perspective. When we acknowledge that this is only temporary and we're heading somewhere, and God actually desires that on the journey and on the pilgrimage, we would actually be other-centered as we've heard that we would actually enjoy the blessings that God has given us? Can we enjoy our marriage? Can we enjoy our children? Can we enjoy our church family? Certainly there's a challenge there. Verse seven, they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. You notice that? Not almost all of them appear. Not the majority of them appear. Not 99 of the 100 appear. Describing a prayer and a psalm of pilgrims, those who know where they're going. It tells us each one will appear. Brother and sister, I pray we'd be encouraged today that we will get there soon. <laughs> we'll get there soon. I remember being a single man and I had this thought, maybe I wouldn't say it out loud, but Lord, let me get married first, 
then you can come back. Lord, let me get into the ministry first, then you could come back. Lord, let me have children first, then come back. As the world gets crazier and crazier and you begin to look at what's happening in the world, you kind of find this, this desire to say, Lord, I want to be taken home now. Lord, I, I'm, I'm ready to be in your presence now. And we'll get there soon, brothers and sisters. But in the meantime, God wants us to be effective in that we might enjoy the journey. We can have joy described in verses one through four. And certainly when we experience the journey described to us in verses five through eight, even the valley of sorrow and pain and difficulty, that we have the church family that we might gather and we have the presence of God several times. We can get here and worship and we can be in his word. And certainly God would have us enjoy it. But notice in verse eight, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. And then he has that word, Selah. Selah. One pastor has often taught me, Pastor Joe there in Philadelphia. He says the common vernacular of Selah, it's, it's, it's the English way of saying, what do you think about that? You stop and meditate. What do you think about that eighth verse? I believe no accident did these sons of Korah write in describing the Lord, they did not write God of Israel, but instead God of Jacob. God of Jacob. We know Jacob's story through the book of Genesis. Jacob, the heel grabber, the supplanter, a bit crafty, and certainly a man who at times is on the run, whether from his brother or a man who needed, ultimately, as we all do, an identity change. Jacob became Israel, princed, governed by God. But yet we see so often, especially in the Psalms, we are reminded that the God of Jacob, it reminds us that on this journey, God is changing us. That God is walking all of us through this process of sanctification. And I dare say that oftentimes the greatest sanctification happens for you and I, one, when we have the proper perspective and we can actually see, okay, God, this is difficult. I am in the valley of Bacar right now. I do sense, Lord, that I'm the only one. There's a bit of a solitary sense in my circumstances. But with a proper perspective, we can say, God, you're using this to change me. You're using this that I might be conformed into the image of your son. And what a wonderful reminder, even there in the hint, the God of Jacob who changes and gives new identities. And I believe as you look at verse 9, 10, 11, and 12, look how this ends here. Verse 9, O oh God, behold our shield. Look upon the face of your anointed, writes the psalmist. For a day in your courts are better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. What a promise. O oh Lord of hosts, in verse 12, Blessed is the man who trusts in you. I believe we begin to see ourselves not as a product or a victim of our environment, but we begin to see ourselves as God's anointed and God's child when in fact our heart is set on a pilgrimage. And as a child of God, I believe truly, as the Bible testifies, that we can truly envy no man. The outline of the psalm, verses 1 through 4, that there is the joy expected for the believer, even through the valley of pain. In verses 5 through 8, we look at the journey, and the journey certainly has ups, downs, lefts, and rights. And as you come now to this jealousy of the believer, we find out that truly no longer can we live in such a way where we envy the things of the world, we envy the things that we used to put focus on, but rather we can agree, as is communicated to us in verse 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand. And I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. You guys, remember the sons of Korah, what was their, their vocation? They were doorkeepers. So in, in a very real sense, what is your vocation? Do you work at the local gas station? Do you work at the local restaurant? Are you a vendor? What, what is your, are you a school teacher? You can actually insert your vocation the same way the sons of Korah did. And you can say likewise, Lord, one day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a server at a restaurant, a teacher in the public school. I would rather be the, the gas station attendant than be anywhere else than in your presence. 
What a beautiful truth that's communicated to us by the sons of Korah. Look at verse 11. For the Lord God, he's a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. All right, you got to work backwards on that promise there. Verse 11. Perhaps then, when it says no good thing will he withhold, that if in fact you find he is withholding something you are asking for, maybe it's not good for us. At least right now. I certainly understood that as a single man. I've talked to men here, single men. Single ladies. God's timing is the best timing, and if God is withholding, if God is keeping a door shut, we must trust in the promise given there that he will withhold no good thing from us if we walk uprightly with him on this journey. O Lord of hosts, in verse 12, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Very interesting, the word there, blessed or blessed. It is used in a plural sense. In fact, I was going through this just on the plane right over here, and, and you're, you're diving into this word, and very fascinating as you look at it, the plural sense, it's, it's the psalmist saying, happy, happy, happy is the man who trusts in you. Blessed, 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 full of joy, at peace, completely satisfied, is the man and the woman who trusts in you, whose heart is set on a pilgrimage. We have had a privilege these last few days. We have had just a glimpse, and I'm telling you, and I've, I've been now three times, a privilege to be a part of the conferences here. They are an incredible work of God. We gather in the worship that happens, in the Bible teaching, in the fellowship, the Spirit of God. Certainly, there's an aroma that goes up to heaven. We are confident God is pleased by what has happened here. We got to go home, don't we? We got to go back out into life, back into our journey, back into our workplace, back to our family. Some of us are either entering into, have just come out of, or maybe are in the midst of the Valley of Baca right now. But let us be reminded that this, Christian, it is not our home. Maybe you're a vagabond here today. Maybe you're someone who you have been aimlessly walking about. You have no idea what God's plan is for your life, what purpose is. Might I dare say that it all begins by bowing your knee to him. Acknowledging you're not a vagabond, certainly no need to be a fugitive running from him, that God would call you into the will of God, into his service, that you might be a pilgrim, that you can then look at the promises and the description given, including the inexpressible joy and satisfaction, and you can own that for yourself, Christian. May that be you. In my closing two minutes, I would have us to look back at the title, the inscription given to us in the Hebrew. This isn't added by the commentators. This is Hebrew. This is God-inspired. The title was this, To the Chief Musician on an Instrument of Gath, a Psalm of the Sons of Korah. Do you recognize the name of that city, Gath? We see it a handful of times. It's given to us before 1 Samuel 17, but most notably, we understand and we probably recognize this because it is there standing in defiance to God and standing in defiance to the children of Israel. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 4, a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines. His name was Goliath from Gath. You look at King David's journey and you look at what will plague throughout the first in 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings, Gath was a stronghold of the enemies of God. Very interesting, and I believe a fascinating thing to consider, that one of the most beautiful psalms, in my opinion, of all the canon, a song which describes the pilgrim's journey in this life, setting their hearts towards the eternal life in the tabernacle of God, in the presence of God, looking for the homeland of being in God's people, is it not interesting that it would be written and sung on such an imperfect instrument? An instrument of gath? Played out on a vessel that bears the scars of rebellion to him and to his people? I believe there are probably those here today who are painfully aware of your imperfect vessel. There are probably people here today who are shamefully aware of a former life of rebellion. There may be people here who bear scars from their rebellion, whether physical, certainly emotional. And I pray that you might find comfort this afternoon that God prefers to write his most beautiful stories on some of the most stained canvases. 
Are you grateful for that, Christian? Doesn't God redeem? Doesn't he bring beauty from ashes? You know, it's the Apostle Paul who in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, jars of clay, these very temporal, finite, so imperfect as we are, the stained canvas of our earthly life, and yet God would choose to put this 84th Psalm of inexpressible joy describing the pilgrimage, Christian, that we all are familiar with, that it would be written on an instrument of gath. Because we have in this earthen vessel a treasure, the Spirit of God living in us, reminding us and sealing us for the day of redemption that we might actually come home very soon. Would you guys pray with me? Father, I, I pray this afternoon, as we have opened your word, we have looked here at this psalm, Lord, a, a pilgrimage prayer. Lord, we have been reminded that this life on this earth, it is full of pain, it is full of loss, and yet, Lord, if we actually are the children of God, if we have set our hearts in our minds, in our perspective on the eternal, Lord, if we are familiar with the one who has sealed us and called us his children, Lord, if we are pilgrims who know that this is not our home, that, Lord, there can be an inexpressible joy and satisfaction found in you. I pray, Lord, for the journey that we are on. Lord, I am aware there are men and women here who have experienced a level of pain and sorrow that, Lord, I have never known. And yet, Lord, we are familiar with the Bible, which tells us that you, in all points, you were tested. You experienced pain. Lord, you experienced being isolated, persecuted, interrogated, laughed at, spit on, beard ripped out. Lord, you experienced solitude. And Lord, that you also conquered death. Lord, that you have paved a way, that you have called us and said to us at the Last Supper that you go away for now to a father's house. And yet, as you go and prepare a place for us, that you would come back for us again soon. I pray, Lord, that we might find encouragement here on this Saturday in May 2024. Lord, that we would continue this pilgrimage and we do it with joy. I pray for every man and woman here, myself included, would you fill us fresh with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, for those of us who are painfully and at times even shamefully aware of our imperfections, Lord, we are shamefully aware of the lives we once lived. We have scars that even remind us. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word that you prefer to use such stories. Lord, would you pour out your spirit on the rest of our time as Pastor Ken delivers the word as we worship and as we gather for just a few more minutes in this day. Would you be pleased by what it is we gather here to do? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.